Okay, so um, thank you, Robert, for that introduction, um, and thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Um, hopefully, the air conditioning in some way compensates for not being out in the lovely sunshine. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here today to talk to you um, about my adventures in corporate coaching. Um, as has been said, my name is Mia O'Gorman, and I've been working in the corporate coaching space for um, about the last nearly 20 years, um, which is scary. Um, what I do now is that I'm a coach and a coaching supervisor and I also work as a consultant in leadership development. Um, how I do that um, is in partnership with Animas where I'm one of the tutor team. Um, my personal business is Coaching with Mia um, where I coach and supervise locally to where I live in Cheltenham um, and also a course online. And Fourth Path is a leadership development organisation um, recently that I've set up um, with a, a long-standing friend and colleague, David Jenkins, and that's where we collaborate together with other partners to do work and um, very much in the corporate space, um, so mostly large private sector organisations. So I'll say um, a bit more about me and how I came to be doing that combination of things in a little while. Um, but firstly, just wanted to acknowledge my connection with Animas. I'm reasonably new to the Animas community and um, first had a conversation with Nick not quite two years ago. And that was about enrolling in the supervision diploma with Animas, um, which I then completed. Um, so loved doing that. And I had an experience that I know many of you will have had as well, which is as soon as I came in contact with the organisation, I thought, you know what, this is the place for me. This is where I really want to train and study. Um, and the reasons for that was a sense of um, energy um, and commitment and ambition. Um, and then what I'd add to that as I've um, become part is that word community. Um, so those are the things that, that I really love and that um, I hope I'll be able to um, add to um, through the talk this evening. Coaching for me has really been um, a vocation. Um, I'm a big Radio 4 listener um, and one morning last year I heard this definition of vocation from Canon and Angela Tilby and she said it's the place where a particular person's deep joy meets the world's deep need, where what's particular about us is linked to the service of others. So it's a strong um, intention for me to serve through coaching um, to help other people um, you know, fulfil their dreams and ambitions too. So it's my great joy to be here tonight um, and I hope that I'll also be in service of you um, through sharing this talk. So what I'd like to do is just briefly outline um, the pathway um, for the next hour or so um, and then give you an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit more. So I'm guessing this is probably quite small writing for those at the back, so I will read these through. Um, after we've got started, I'll um, go into a bit more about my career history, my adventures so far in corporate coaching, um, and then introduce a model which I found really helpful to locate my practice, and I hope will help you locate yours as well and think about where you could work in this world. We'll then go on to navigating the organisation. So what are the structures, the processes, the typical setup and expectations in the corporate world? Then getting a bit more granular, I'll talk about some experiences that I've had as a coach over the years and also the coachee's experience um, of being coached within their organisations. Um, so what I've seen, what I've heard as feedback and some observations there. I'm also going to talk about um, supervision um, and its importance and relevance to the corporate world and then we'll have time for questions and discussions and for those of you who are able to, um, maybe we'll visit the bar as well. So that's the plan for the next hour or so. So to help you get to know each other in terms of, this is not an existential question by the way, who you are, um, for those in the room that may have that bent, um, so just the basics. So. Um, uh, name, uh, kind of what your current coaching role is or involvement with coaching. But then, just briefly in your pairs, how would you describe or even define corporate coaching? When we use that phrase, what does it mean to you? And then also to be ready to um, share just by showing um, a raised hand when we come back together, what percentage of your coaching experience is in corporate coaching? So we're just going to go in quartiles, so less than 25%, between 25 and 50%, 50 to 75% or 75% or more. So be ready to raise your hand according to one of those. So literally just about three minutes in a fit of generosity, get introduced to the people next to you um, and have a chat about how you would describe corporate coaching.
Okay then, thank you everyone. If I can get you to... Thanks everyone. Um, so big questions for a short amount of time. Um, so we'd love to hear um, some of your descriptions. How would you describe or define um, corporate coaching? Who will start us off? Thank you. Great. So yeah, it very often is for the more senior leaders in the organisation, um, though not exclusively, um, increasingly so. What else? Yes, so it's a common theme, so how to be resilient um, and to progress in the organisation. Great. Any more? Thank you. It's also partly used for performance issues. Um, coaching is the magic pill for <laughs> the result of performance. So very often it's a engagement of three people I measure coach. Yeah, so that three-way engagement is really important within corporate coaching and probably one of the distinguishing factors, I'll talk to a bit more to this later actually, between say, if I very broadly call it life coaching, where an individual client has <coughs> chosen to engage a coach themselves and is funding it themselves, and corporate coaching, where the organisation is paying the bill and is very much a stakeholder. Um, and the um, coaching assignment then, as you rightly say, could be to help someone who's underperforming um, although it shouldn't be an excuse for the line manager not doing their performance management. So that's one of the complexities to navigate as well. You know, is coaching really the right intervention for this person? Great, so thank you for those. I'm sure there'll be many more. Um, but if I share, this is a long one. I hope you're ready for this. Um, so a definition uh, from Richard Kilberg um, of corporate coaching is that it's a helping relationship formed between a client who has managerial authority and responsibility in an organisation and a consultant who uses a wide range of behavioural techniques and methods to help the client achieve a mutually identified set of goals to improve his or her professional performance and personal satisfaction and, consequently, to improve the effectiveness of the client's organisation within a formally defined coaching agreement. So he wrote all that and only put in two commas for me as a speaker. <laughs> So there's a lot to consider there in terms of um, the individuals being coached, the organisational context and what the coach brings. And although he doesn't mention psychological dimensions there, um, actually Richard as a writer talks a lot about the importance of feelings, emotions, attitudes in executive coaching um, as well as behavioural interventions. Um, and do note as well that he mentions personal satisfaction. So while the context of the coaching is organisational, um, actually people's home life, um, I've found, almost always will come into coaching in some way as well, whether it's work-life balance or other stresses and strains. Um, in a way, it can't not. You, know, you can't just coach someone from the, the neck up. You're, you're working with the whole person. So let's have a think about, um, again, who's in the room in terms of your own experiences in the corporate coaching field. So if we can get you to raise your hands if this would be a new avenue for you in your coaching practice, so less than 25% of your total practice. So gosh, probably about half the people in the room. Okay, thank you. Um, who would say 25 to 50%? Probably four, five hands going up. Um, 50 to 75? Uh, four that I could see is tricky with the post and more than 75%. Okay, so quite small numbers, again, about five probably in total. So thank you for sharing that. It's helpful for me to know um, uh, sort of where to place emphasis as we go through the evening. So to give a bit of context for the corporate coaching landscape, I'm going to share some of the key um, outcomes with you from the most recent Riddler report. So the Riddler Report is um, conducted about every three years or so um, in conjunction with the European Mentoring and Coaching Council. And it's one of the most important sources of information about what's going on in corporate coaching um, and what the next steps are likely to be. 
It's completed by um, senior sponsors of coaching in large organisations, so it will be people like HR directors, coaching directors, um, perhaps a director of organisational development. Some of those for global organisations, as you can see, um, like Deloitte, uh, Lloyds Banking Group, but also organisations in the public sector will take part, so like the NHS, Cancer Research, BBC. So it's large organisations, those are just a small sample of the, the organisations that respond. There's over 100 respondents to the survey. And in this most recent report, um, what they said was important to them about coaching was that it increases business performance and increases self-awareness in the individuals who receive the coaching. Both of those two got a 92% response rate um, in the Riddler report. The least relevant aspect of coaching for organisations was the coach's ability to give advice or guidance um, to their coaches. Um, only about 32% of organisations saw that as relevant to their definition of corporate coaching. In terms then of the organisational reasons for investing in coaching, it's to increase leadership capability and to invest in the people that they really value. So I've found working with different organisations that some have very much got coaching as something that is prestigious, that is to be aspired to, people feel rewarded when they receive it, and yet still there are some organisations where it might be more seen as something that you get if you're underperforming. So there are those two sides to the coin, but certainly these leading organisations are very much seeing it as something that's an investment to help people develop and grow. Coaching is delivered more or less evenly in a corporate context between internal coaching teams, so be that people perhaps with an HR or an L&D background um, or leaders who've been trained to coach as part of their role, and external coaches. If you follow the professional press in this area, you'll have seen a lot more recently about the increased use of internal coaching teams. However, 57% of organisations still say they see use of external coaches continuing to grow in the next two years. Um, so there's reason for optimism for all of us there. External coaching is most commonly used for either senior leaders or where some psychological support is required because it's expected that people who coach full-time or for a large proportion of their professional role will be most likely to have that extra depth of psychological knowledge. Other things that are going on is really the professionalisation of coaching um, as an industry. Um, supervision is seen as a fundamental requirement for external coaches um, by 88% of organisations. So if you're not in supervision now, I'd really urge you to, to look towards that. And 68% will expect or even insist on um, an accreditation from one of the major coaching bodies. So there is some confusion out there between accreditation and qualification, um, but it's really worth um, pushing on and pursuing your credentials um, if you're at that stage in your own coaching journey, um, because it's becoming more and more looked for um, and even insisted upon. Um, Three-way contracts we touched upon already today, um, and 75% of organisations commissioning external coaches will expect there to be um, a three-way meeting between the coach, the coachee, and the line manager. Um, and fundamentally, that's about making sure the coaching is really connected to the business and to the person's current role and how they can add value, even when it's also um, a growth assignment. So something else the Riddler Report comments on is fees for coaching. So I think no matter how vocationally we feel about it, we do also all like to get paid. Um, and the range varies hugely. So for mid-level leaders, um, typical fees per hour could be in the range of 200 to 500 pounds. For senior executives, it's likely to be in the range of 300 to 700 pounds per hour. And if you were to be coaching the CEO or a main board member of one of those very large organisations, um, then you could potentially be looking at fees of 400 to up to 1,000 pounds an hour. Um, so there's lots to go for, which is encouraging as well. So having set the context in terms of the landscape for corporate coaching, I'm going to say a bit more now um, about my own journey, um, how I got to be where I am today. So I'm going to visit the people on this side of the room a bit. I feel like I've been a bit left out. So for me, um, my background is in HR, or in fact, it was still called personnel um, when I graduated in 1998. So I joined um, Rover Group, as the company was then, as a personnel graduate. 
Um, and the first phase of my career in terms of coaching, I've labelled up as firm foundations. So at the age of 26, I got introduced to the GROW model for the first time, um, started to learn to coach, and within a couple of months of that, um, was on a development centre. Um, and one of the assessors there was a, an HR director, and um, so was working for HBOS Bank at this time, um, who gave me the lovely feedback at the end of my coaching role play that he wanted to stand up and applaud. So now I had some recognition for something that I was just starting to learn as a skill and which was a huge encouragement. While I was at HBOS, um, they rolled out a coaching culture programme for about 2,000 managers in the retail bank and I was one of the trainers to deliver that programme. Um, what was fantastic about that, apart from being immersed in coaching for pretty much the whole year, was that the Train the Trainer um, was provided by John Whitmore's organisation, Performance Consultants. Um, so I didn't get to work directly with Sir John, but with two of the other founders, David Hemery and David Whitaker, um, which of course was an enormous privilege to be with some of the people who had been partly responsible for bringing coaching really into the business world from the sporting world. Um, another key developmental programme for me at that time um, was called Client Centred Consulting. Um, and although it wasn't directly coaching skills, um, there was so much in there about listening really well, about different types of questioning, um, about being in relationship with clients who might be struggling with difficult issues. Um, that I can now look back on it and recognise a lot of that training was really rooted in humanistic um, tradition. So that was really powerful for me as well. Um, and I had opportunities to work as an internal coach. That first phase was really about learning um, and immersion. Second phase was starting to go broader and deeper. Um, so I moved into an external consultancy role. Um, because what I found was that in my internal role, I was doing all the project management, all the stakeholder politics, all of the difficult stuff, but I was expected to bring in experts um, to do what I considered the most fun bit, the facilitation or the one-to-one -one coaching um, with the talent groups that I was looking after. So I decided I would cross the floor, become an external consultant, because I wanted the opportunity to keep developing my skills. So this then took me into um, qualifying in various tools, um, working in a leadership development context, and also really building my business empathy. So needing to connect with quickly um, a wide range of different businesses as an external consultant. I also funded some training as an NLP coach at that time, and then that led on to the third phase, um, which I've called psychology and professionalism. So um, up until the end of last year, I was working for um, a consultancy that specialised in emotional intelligence as a leadership development approach. Here, most of my colleagues were psychologists by background, um, which I'm not, and I really felt it was important to gain a formal coaching qualification. Um, so I took a postgraduate certificate in business and executive coaching, which had a strong psychological element to it. By this time I was working in more formal executive coaching assignments, um, so assignments of six to ten sessions, um, navigating the organisation, having three-way meetings, so started to feel like I was really professionalising my practice. And also began to receive supervision, um, so I was lucky to have group supervision sometimes with Professor Bill Critchley from Ashridge, um, which was a real privilege and great learning. Um, also started doing more coach tutoring on um, accredited programmes and also co-supervising on those programmes with others who were qualified. <coughs> that led on last year to the fourth and the current phase, um, which I've called supervision and collaborations, where I decided I would also get qualified as a supervisor and took the DCS. Um, and I'm now working as of September last year um, as an independent practitioner and in the collaborations I described. So what this means is I've now really got the opportunity to set out and put into practice um, my philosophies and principles of coaching based on everything that I've learned to date. That's come through in things like a managed coaching service um, that I've designed for Fourth Path um, and in my coach supervisor work, um, which is a, a real joy. So thinking about locating our practice um, in the corporate arena, I um, recently saw a video of Steve Jobs talking to um, graduates at Stanford, it's their commencement speech, and as well as encouraging those graduates to follow their hearts and intuitions and do work that they love, which is all advice I heartily endorse, he also reflects back on his own career and says that sometimes you can only connect the dots by looking backwards. 
So this model um, originally developed um, by a gentleman called Witherspoon, referred to as a coaching continuum or spectrum. Um, and as I look at this, I can really see how it reflects the journey that I've been on so far. So the idea here is that at the beginning of our coach training, we're more likely to be working on um, the areas towards the left, so skills, performance, working into behaviour, but that as we build our own experience and skill, um, we'll tend to work um, further to the right. Now, it's not exclusively the case. Of course, all good coaching can be transformational. So if you think about a skill like listening, it's one of the first things that you'll learn on a coaching programme. But again, as Carl Rogers wrote about in the humanistic tradition, um, truly being listened to, truly having another person with you in relationship can in itself be um, transformational and spur growth. So we could be doing transformational coaching early on. Hawkins and Smith um, added to this model by um, setting out the types of coaches that would be likely to be working in these different areas. So of course in an organisation, um, as happened at HBOS, we've got lots of managers encouraged to coach and the expectation is that their range would be around skills and performance. You've then got more dedicated internal coaches with probably a higher level of training, perhaps an accredited programme, who might broadly be expected to work um, up into the developmental space and then external coaches with significant experience um, and greater depth of training um, would be expected to cover um, the whole of the spectrum. Another note to this is that just because we can be deep and transformational doesn't necessarily mean we always should be. We um, need to make sure that whatever we're doing is in service of the coachee and that if what's really required is a skills or behavioural input that we don't go to the deep stuff and because of our own interest in it but that it's really in service of the coachees. So next is another opportunity to have a chat with your neighbours and think about locating your own practice. The questions on here are just thought prompts. Um, you're not going to have time to address them all. So pick one that appeals to you in terms of how you would trace your own development as a coach. Does this model resonate for you? Where is the centre of gravity of your practice today? How do you pitch your coaching to prospective clients in the corporate arena or elsewhere? And how do you decide in the moment what to work on? So those are your thought starter questions. Again, just a couple of minutes, um, and then we'll hear some answers back. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. So hopefully these are conversations that will continue beyond today, but let's just take a few um, responses to any of the questions on the screen or what came up during your conversation. Yeah, so I think I agree with you in part in that the coaching remit for more junior people might be around development and current role. Um, another model I've not got in tonight but would, might be interesting for you to follow up would be to have a look at the leadership pipeline. Um, so that was Sharan Drotter and Noel. And he talks about the transitions that you make, say, from individual contributor to team leader could be just as much of a powerful transition as, say, from a functional manager to a general manager higher up the tree because of the need to use your time and your value that you bring to the role um, and skills differently. Um, so I think you're, you're right in part for me, but also um, you might find that transformational work's happening at any level in the organisation. And I think when um, you're working at the skills performance and possibly the behaviour end, um, it tends to be what we might call single loop learning. So there's something that you need to learn that's quite specific to a particular context and you learn that thing through coaching and that's great and you can do that one thing better. I think what you've described there is more um, like double loop learning where you um, stretch yourself further in your development by learning new things about yourself that apply in multiple contexts 
Um, and then you could even go as far as to say um, transformation would be triple loop learning because it involves a paradigm shift, so seeing yourself um, and the world um, very differently as a result. So I think all of those are, are active in coaching. Okay, thank you um, for sharing those couple of examples. So another thing that I'd like to mention here is the idea of um, business empathy. So I talked about that as something that I started to um, gain more of um, as I moved into external consultancy. So this is nice and easy, a shorter definition. Um, business empathy is when you've got the ability to comprehend the business issues without personal experience of the subjects. Um, and I mention this because I found it quite important in um, getting work um, as a corporate coach. So even when I've moved into a consultancy environment um, and that was part of the business that we were doing, there's still this process that we uh, need to go through where two or three coach profiles are given to a prospective coachee um, and they get to choose. Um, so I had to get used to both being chosen and on some occasions not being chosen. Um, so how do you get yourself across um, on paper perhaps if it's a profile or in a chemistry meeting and I found that um, strengthening my business empathy was important so certainly that many years back um, I was often much younger than my coaches. Um, I was a woman where most of my clients were in more male dominated industries and I've certainly coached a much higher proportion of men over the years than women. Um, and my background was in what's often seen as a soft area um, of personnel or HR. My leadership experience um, directly has only ever been of a small team of consultants. But yet my clients were typically older, more senior men, either in core business operations or strategy or the hard functions like IT or finance, um, and sometimes leading dozens or even hundreds of people. So it's then thinking about, well, how do I gain credibility with those individuals? Um, how do I get across what I have to bring um, and make them want to, to work with me? So for me, I would initially in my coaching profile um, lean quite heavily on some of my sector experience. So the three sectors I worked in before moving into consultancy were automotive, finance and energy. And also to think about the privileged perspective that HR has into what's required of leaders who are looking to move up the hierarchy over time um, and to succeed through change. Um, and those kind of things were helpful to me as I started to build um, a portfolio of clients. And then, of course, over the years, you get more, um, more evidence of your success, more testimonials. Um, and also, I've got a lot more grey hairs now than I used to. Um, so the age thing has become um, less of an issue. So, of course, what you have to bring will be unique to you. Um, but I think it's really worth investing time in putting together a great coaching profile that expresses that um, incredible business language. Um, so cut the psychobabble, cut any woo-woo, you know, how is it that you're going to demonstrate you can add value um, to those leaders? So next, think about the um, organisational structures, so navigating the organisation um, as a corporate coach. Um, a few years back, I would find that coaching was often provided in organisations by a really wide range of coaches. Um, some would be working in organisations similar to mine, consultancies, doing leadership development, and we'd get asked to start working with individuals off the back of that. Um, some were ex-employees of that organisation um, that had been invited back to support others. Um, some were from uh, maybe more dedicated coaching businesses or coaching agencies. And often a lot of senior managers would have their own budgets. So to an extent, they could bring in who they liked because they could sign it off. And there was relatively little governance in place. I would say certainly 10 years ago, even as recently as five years ago. But that's um, one of the things that's really changed in the corporate environment. That coaching used to get referred to as the Wild West of leadership development. So it's an unregulated industry. Anyone can set up and call themselves a coach. And you had you know, lots of individuals bringing in whoever they wanted to be their coach. As now it tends to be much more the case, um, particularly with the large organisations that um, typical respondents to the Riddler report, that there is often um, someone senior in charge of coaching in the organisation, that there's governance, that there are structures, there are processes for accessing coaching, um, and they might work with quite a restricted range of suppliers. So it's thinking about in that context, you know, how do we navigate um, and get into the organisation? So I appreciate that this slide is not fully readable. Um, the purpose of including it is just to talk through an overview the managed coaching service that I've designed um, for Fourth Path, where we do our corporate work. 
So you can see down the left-hand side, um, for an organisation that wants to set this up, um, the first thing we'd want to work with them on is defining the framework. So what's the purpose of, organ of coaching in this organisation? Uh, who is it for? Is it for a particular hierarchy, a leadership level? Is it for a talent group? Um, is it potentially for anyone? Then to think about um, the pattern of coaching assignments, so how many sessions, how are they spaced out, how long will each session be, um, and also the protocol. So who um, can authorise coaching, who could provide a brief, um, who should we interact with um, in the organisation. Um, the brief itself, so someone will think that coaching is a good idea, and then we might take a brief either verbally um, or through um, a coaching request form. And then the next step is to be selecting the coach. Um, so this is the whole of the grey section in the middle. So quite a lot goes on here. So here we would send out coach profiles for the coachee to review. Um, the coachee might have the option to have a chemistry call or meeting um, with one or both of the coaches. They make their decision, we get feedback as to why, um, and then share that news with the coaches whose profiles were put forward. Important next step um, is a three-way meeting between the coach and the coachee and the line manager. And then the coaching itself can begin once the coaching agenda has been determined. At the end of the coaching, I um, would expect to meet with the manager or the coaching sponsor again um, as part of the evaluation process. Um, an evaluation is something that we try and do in a really um, rigorous um, way so that we get both some quantitative ratings um, using a net promoter score, but also some qualitative feedback um, to support the coach in their development. And of course, if you imagine, you might be doing a coaching programme working with the top 100 leaders um, in a business division of a large organisation. Um, it's really important to be able to track how coaching's impacted against the intended objectives. So all of that will be going on um, in that managed coaching process. I um, also wanted to pause a bit more on the three-way um, contracting meeting because this is one of the things that's um, quite different in um, corporate coaching to in the life coaching space. So the best uh, method I've come across for doing this um, is um, from Jenny Rogers. Um, so her book, A Handbook of Coaching Skills, is a, a great reference I've used over the years. Um, and what she suggests is to do it in three stages. First stage, you and the boss. Second stage, you, the boss and the coachee. And the third stage, you get the boss to go and have just you and the coachee alone. So what you get by doing it this way um, is a really rich picture of both explicit and implicit data. Because when you're with the boss, you can ask them, how do they see this individual? What do they see as the objectives for the coaching? Um, how do they feel about that individual receiving coaching? Because believe you me, if line managers are looking at their best person potentially getting promoted and having to replace them, they're not always that enthusiastic. Next, you can get the coachee in. Um, and what you do at this point to start with is ask the boss to say to the coachee what they've just said to you. Um, and at this point, you'll get to see for yourself how honest they really have been in the past with the coachee, if there are any underperformance issues or if there are any reservations. Um, so they'll often say it quite differently to the coachee, um, to how they've said it to you. And of course you'll want to get the coachee's own um, perspective on what they would like to bring into the coaching agenda. Um, and to talk here about things like support. So coaching almost always involves making change. So if that individual is going to change how they do their role, how is the boss going to support them directly? Um, how is the boss going to support them when those changes impact other stakeholders within the organisation, for example? Finally, you get the boss to go, and it's just you and the coachee. Um, and here again, um, sometimes additional or different things will come out. So you might already have had the opportunity to notice any tensions in the relationship between the coachee and their boss. This is often the point where they will disclose um, if there's anything they haven't said to you so far about difficulties there. Um, or even things like, actually, I really appreciate this, but I'm quite thinking I might be going to leave this organisation. So you can start to see how just this beginning of the process can be a real test of your skills as a facilitator, sometimes as a negotiator, um, can test how you handle issues of confidentiality, um, because it might be in the organisation's policy that you're not allowed to coach the coachee on how to leave. 
Conversely, I've had a couple of assignments where the brief has been, help this person be happy, whether that means they stay in their current role, find a different role with us, or leave. What we're concerned about at the moment is that they're not happy, they're not at their best, and the coaching has been fully funded by the organisation with that openness of brief. Um, so, yeah, the, the three-way contracting process is um, kind of a really, um, really rich and important part um, of getting the coaching off to the best possible start. And your job after that, when you've got all of that important information, will be to put together the coaching agenda. Another difference that I've noticed um, in terms of um, being a corporate coach is... Um, the use of diagnostics and toolkits, um, it's something that we use much more than um, I've found most life coaches do as I've got to know people through the Animas community. So these might be things such as personality measures, um, they might be um, quite wide survey measures of an individual's leadership impact, particularly where they're senior. So they might have 50 or 100 people that fill in a survey about their leadership style. Um, or it might be more behavioural based feedback collected through um, a 360 process. So often individuals in these kinds of roles will be very data rational um, and they're quite welcome getting something hard and tangible um, that tells them about how they're doing, how they're seen to be doing by others. But also of course, again when you think about coaching as part of an organisation culture change programme or development for a particular talent group, the collective data um, is real gold dust for the organisation, um, so it can help flag up um, development areas that might be addressed through group programmes um, and also strengths in the organisation, can be linked to things like um, employee engagement data. So almost always the individual profiles will stay confidential to the individual, but be encouraged to share them with the line manager. But the collective, anonymised, aggregate data, um, when you think about working with a whole cadre of leaders, really, really important. Now, of course, some of these tools are proprietary, um, so you would need to complete um, a qualification with a relevant organisation to be able to use them. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily something to rush out and do, but it's certainly something to think about if this is a, um, an area you want to work in. Yeah, yeah, so both. Um, so some tools you would complete before the coaching starts, so something that's not evaluative, if you like, like a personality profile, so there's no bad outcome in that, but it's really rich data for the individual to know. Um, and potentially 360 feedback might be quite early on as well, um, not always in the first session. Um, something like a wider leadership climate survey again might well be done in advance and absolutely the organisation would be repeating that um, at the end particularly in a large programme because that will be one of their measures of return on investment you know so have we shifted the leadership culture in this organisation in the eyes of the next perhaps couple of thousand people that work for the leadership group that we're working with so yeah great question so things that we'll work with in the coaching room and with our coaches and that also are organisationally valuable. Um, but then also toolkits for leaders. So as we're encouraging people to change um, or to be more aware, for example, of their own personality and differences in style with perhaps personalities of others in a leadership team. Um, so tool, this example in the middle um, is a tool around working with um, emotions, so vocabulary for feelings. And of course, everything's going online these days, so we might support um, people with um, online um, tools and things that are mobile um, app development as well, um, so that you can start to form um, communities of learning. If you imagine that you've got 10 leadership teams, each going through a programme, you might have um, some community sharing um, an, an app that way. Also, um, toolkits for coaches, um, so really from the earliest days with HBOS and through into uh, my consultancy career, another area I've worked with is coach training, um, so to both informal but also formally accredited programmes. Um, and toolkits for coaches can just be great to get people um, confident in working with new areas. So again, um, the images on the screen there, um, you'll be able to read some of the, the larger words. Um, the sets of coaching cards for working with different feelings and emotions. Um, so we're calling these moody cards. This is uh, something else we're developing at Fourth Path. So 71 different emotions, um, seven questions that we've written for each emotion. So those of you that are better at maths than me will know that's a whole bank of about X hundred questions. <laughs> 
um, that you've got um, to go to. Um, so that's uh, another example of something that we might include in a, in a coach training programme. So the next bit to go on to is a bit more about the experience um, of being a corporate coach. Before I move on to that, um, any other kind of questions or comments at this stage? You mentioned being accredited. Is there any body which is better than another for um, internal coaching? Um, I don't think so. So each body has slightly different flavour and the levelling's a bit different. So for example, for some of my clients in the past, they've wanted an accreditation, but they've also seen themselves as quite time poor. So in that case, the EMCC's foundation level has been ideal because the number of hours that you need in taught workshop and also in terms of coaching practice is, is quite small, so it's compact, but it's still a, a proper accreditation from a proper coaching body. Um, others have chosen um, ICF um, almost for the opposite reason because even at the, um, the ACC, which is their first rung on the ladder, um, that has a much um, higher requirement in terms of hours tuition um, but also hours of coaching practice. Um, then you've got Association for Coaching, which is one that I'm personally less familiar with, but that's another body. <laughs> You've then got perhaps for people that are moving from um, a business career, senior leadership career into coaching, um, you've got Apex Association of Professional Executive Coaches where you, you know, for them you need to have held a senior leadership position already. So it, it is still an alphabet soup um, and there is still a kind of lack of formal alignment between them but no, it's very much horses for courses. Sure, so that's where um, more qualitative feedback is also really important. So um, the coachee's own experience of the process, um, they will say if they feel different inside, um, or we might collect, um, they might get feedback from other people around them that they're noticing um, the differences. Um, so yeah, we would just, just ask for what they see as different in themselves um, at the end um, to when they started. Yeah. How do you deal with the issue of attribution, <coughs> i.e. this improvement was directly related to coaching as opposed to something else that's happened there, my manager is changing? Sure. So it's, um, it's really tough, I think, with any leadership development intervention to do that. So if you're familiar with um, Kirk Patrick's model um, of evaluating um, development and training, so he has four levels. Um, so level one, effectively, um, is happy sheets. Did the person like the experience they had? Um, level two is shifts in their knowledge. Level three is shifts in behaviour. Um, and level four is the hardest one to demonstrate, which is that direct um, return on investment and business value added. So if you have a look at Kirkpatrick's model, you'll find there's lots of different suggested interventions at the different uh, levels of evaluation. So you can do it, do it that way. Um, sorry, say the question again. There's one so more thing I was going to say. about how much can you directly relate something sure. to... Yeah, so another way that it's done, and there's quite a lot of uh, comment about this in the Riddler report, um, is just to um, invite, say, the coachee and other stakeholders, such as their line manager, to comment on um, what they would attribute directly to the coaching, um, you know, whether it would be 50% of the result achieved or 80% of the result achieved. So although it's looser, um, you can get a sense of the ROI there. Thank you for repeating the question. I knew there was one more thing that I wanted to say. That's great. Okay, so, oh, one more, then we'll move on. Thank you. The diagnostic tools, is that something that we would be expected to use within a corporate coaching? So I've certainly found it much more commonly expected. It's not universally used. And then, of course, if you take something like personality profiling, there's so many different tools out there on the market. So what one organisation likes to use might not necessarily be the same as another. Um, but I think if you've got, um, for example, a good understanding of a type-based Jungian tool, then um, you know, officially the word is you need to be accredited in each individual tool. Um, but I would say in reality you would be able to look at a profile and work with it. So it might be in that kind of situation that um, somebody would oversee, would have responsibility for being the licensed user, um, and they would make an assessment of, of which coaches they bring in to, to work with those tools. I was just wondering if you didn't use that <coughs> Yeah, I wouldn't say it would rule you out, um, but depending on the organisation and their own preferences, if they are sort of embedded in working with a particular tool, then it might be that they would say that um, all of the coaches would need to have the ability to work with that particular tool. Great. 
Okay, so let's move on then to um, a bit more about the um, experience of being a corporate coach. Um, and people often say, you know, what have been the real challenges? What have been kind of the really meaty, difficult ones? And so these have been, for me, um, more around where there have been challenges within the relationship itself. So either where somebody has uh, not wanted coaching at all, um, or has not wanted coaching by me because I didn't fit what they thought a corporate coach should look like, um, or also sometimes where I found it difficult to connect with a coachee, so perhaps someone I've been allocated to work with in a, a big programme that hasn't been easy to build that rapport. So I've come to term these things, I'm kind of battling the beasts, and some of them certainly are the beasts of the boardroom, but what I'm really meaning here is more the beasts inside, um, so our own defences that can get in the way. What I've found helpful for kind of working this through um, is the OK Corral, um, which if you've uh, done your transactions model with Animas or if you know transactional analysis as a field of psychology, um, is really helpful here. So can I just get a quick show of hands if you're already familiar with this? So actually pretty much everyone, so it's great. So these are attitudinal positions that we might take up at any point in time. Hopefully we all spend lots of time in ideal, but when we're knocked off balance, when our defences are triggered for whatever reason, we might find ourselves holding a submissive or critical or blocked attitude and that will manifest itself in our behaviour. What I want to share with you today is a version of this that I came across, um, adapted specifically for the coaching context, um, which when I saw it, I thought, how come I've never seen this before? Um, and it's in a great book called Emotional Intelligence Coaching. Um, the authors there are Neil, Spencer Arnell and Wilson. And they adapted the OK Corral to be really specific to the coaching context. And I further adapted it a little bit um, just to neaten up some of the wording on this slide. So here you've got, um, hopefully again, lots of time coaching credibly. So I feel OK as a coach um, and I'm holding you as my coachee in high regard. However, what could happen if I feel I'm OK and you're not is that I end up coaching disapprovingly. So perhaps um, there's a value that my coachee holds that I don't agree with or they've done something that I don't like. On the other hand, the tables might be reversed. I might find myself coaching fearfully. So what if somebody's much more senior than me? What if they've cancelled me at the last minute for the third time running? Um, what if I've tried a particular technique in coaching and it just doesn't seem to have worked for them, um, even though it's worked brilliantly in the past? So I might then be holding back and be guarded. And then it's also possible to find yourself coaching awkwardly. Um, so here, feeling stuck, feeling perhaps distracted, um, unsure of our own ability and the person we're working with and, and really freezing up. Um, a brief example of this for me um, in terms of coaching judgmentally was uh, working with a real technical expert. So this was somebody who was probably the only person in an organisation of 30,000 odd that knew the entire history of the pension schemes. So in certain ways they're very valuable to the organisation, but as the business had changed around them, the expectations of this individual had also changed, and so the coaching was to work on quite dramatically shifting things like their communication style, how they engaged with stakeholders, the level of empathy that they would demonstrate. Um, and the first couple of sessions seemed to go quite well, but then in the third session it felt like three steps forward, two steps back. I'd found myself almost hypnotised by a series of long and ravelling, winding stories that I couldn't connect to each other. And that was an example of exactly what I'd been told by the manager was one of the things that needed to change. And despite having had their 360 nomination form for three months, the individual hadn't completed it still. So I was starting to feel um, frustrated, disappointed. Um, then I felt guilty for feeling those things. And I recognised I was at real risk of moving into coaching judgmentally um, in the, in the follow-on session. What I then needed to do was to find a way to get back to um, holding that individual in really high regard that they deserved. So I took some time out to know what, um, or to review what I knew objectively. So, for example, their manager had explained that they'd been badly managed in the past, they hadn't been given appropriate feedback on their behaviour before, and also thought about the scale of changes in behaviour um, that were being asked of this individual. 
Um, a value that we really had in common was quality. This was someone who was really driven to do the best that he could for his stakeholders. Um, and also there were some things I'd got to know about him personally. This was someone with really high and strong family values, community values, and he had a great cheeky sense of humour that I'd seen um, a couple of times during our sessions. So by reconnecting with those things, I was able to um, shift uh, my position um, and make sure that by the next session, I was then ready to be back to um, coaching um, in a credible way, being um, fully present um, and in service of that individual. Of course, there are lots of different ways of doing it. Um, these are some suggestions if you find yourself coaching from um, any one of those three paces to help you get back to coaching really credibly and um, really authentically. Um, I was hoping to have a bit of a pause again here for um, discussion for you to think about your movement on this group. Am I OK, Robert, for time to do that? Brilliant, thank you. So um, a few minutes again with your neighbours. When have you found yourself coaching fearfully, awkwardly, disapprovingly? And what have you done to get yourself back to that ideal coaching credibly space? Away you go. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. So again, lots of energy there. Um, who is feeling brave enough to share their own story? Thank you, sir. Okay, so I, I'll just say to my colleagues behind me, I've got a particular person who I'm coaching at the moment who I feel slightly awkward about because she's fairly well qualified professionally in terms of having an MBA, start her own business, etc. And, and um, she did, I found out in one of the sessions she was or has worked for the same organisation I had, and she was identified as one of the top 100 managers. So I feel a bit awkward because I feel slightly um, mm. inferior mm. Uh, based on her experience. And I'm sort of wondering, not that what she's doing for me, but really, why she's once coaching in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Have you asked her? <laughs> uh, well, I asked her in a roundabout way. I mean, obviously, she started these sessions, but I still feel awkward because I just feel that maybe, to me, she's, I feel she's maybe more, more superior and mm. more knowledge than I do. Mm. Yeah. So it is coming back to those things. You've got business empathy, you've got organisational knowledge. Um, you don't have to be as expert as her um, in what she's doing. And you'll bring your specialist coaching skills and your ability to give feedback um, and your ability to listen and to ask great questions. And all of those things will have value in the coaching relationship. So it is that case of um, you know, remembering your value, I guess, would, would be my biggest encouragement there. But thank you for sharing the story. Um, could we hear one more? I realized 
felt like she didn't want to be coached. Mm -hmm. So it's, it felt like she had her own um, sort of, she already had an idea of what she wanted to do and it wasn't budget. So that was the thing of finding the balance between, okay, do I, should I be honest and say this is where I, I think it is? Or is it that I actually need to develop my coaching skills more to be able to pull more out of her? And I, and I put to myself that if you imagine being called in by an organization to actually, you know, um, work with someone like what you explained, but then they're not budgeting. Mm. You, how do you decide when to call it or to and to or to actually be pushing it? Sure. So, is there a particular place that you'd locate that on for you in the model? I would say. Coaching is the proof. Mm -hmm. Yes, you really wanted her to get on board with it. You know, yeah. this is about your personal change. Yeah. Sure, yeah, I can empathise yeah. with that. So, um, again, um, uh, the encouragement, I think, from, from me and that would be to... Um, is everyone here old enough to remember um, catchphrase on TV in the 80s? <laughs> yeah, so what do you do with Mr Chips? You say what you see. Um, so, you know, you could, um, without needing to be disapproving, but say, you know, I'm seeing here that you're really invested in this idea um, and don't seem willing to consider other options. You know, does, does it feel that way to you? And, and play that back so that you take up that kind of credible space of just being present with the, the data that's there. How do you feed that then back to the, the boss? So feeding back to the boss is another whole part of what did you contract for in your three-way meeting? Um, because if you've contracted for you to have some direct feedback between you and the boss, then, then that would, would be fine. Um, if not, then it might be something that you need to discuss with the coachee, however hard that might be, before you go and feedback, if you've said in your contracting that the coaching itself is going to be confidential between the two of you. Um, so again, goes back to setting yourself up for success at those early phases and, and covering the what ifs. Great, fantastic. So thank you um, both for sharing those examples. So I've talked about some of the challenges and you've had an opportunity to reflect on those together as well. But of course, corporate coaching is also full of joys, um, as with all coaching. So opportunities to work with people who take on board the feedback, push themselves, um, stretch and develop, um, and go ahead and achieve those changes that they want. So probably the one assignment that I've found most joyful and rewarding in that sense was working with a senior associate lawyer. So this was someone who, when we first met, um, was feeling quite frustrated in their job, passed over for promotion, they'd seen their peer group go on to partner, a bit resentful, um, so frustrated at work, exhausted at home, working incredibly long hours, doing what he'd always done, which was complex transactional work um, in corporate mergers. And believe me, that's the limit of knowledge that I got in terms of the legal sense of what he did. However, this was someone who um, really took on board what the coaching was all about. Um, and he had that decision point to make of whether he was going to come to terms with where he was in that organisation, make some of the behavioural changes that were being asked of him to progress to partner. So, for example, he didn't do a lot of business development because he saw it as sleazy and kind of not for him as an introverted rather than an extroverted personality. And he was also known for having what his manager called volcanic outbursts um, in the office. So there were definitely some things to work on um, and he came to accept that. Um, but also, um, what I loved about this over the course of a year um, that we worked together um, was one day um, towards the end of the work, before he'd got promoted, but when he was already in the process, um, we met up for the coaching, breezed into the room, and as part of his check-in, told me two stories. Um, one was how he was really pleased that they'd just won some important client work because of the time they'd spent investing in the relationship and making the client feel that they'd really enjoy working with that team and with that firm. And the second story was that uh, one of the more junior lawyers in his practice area had sought him out for um, a bit of advice because there was a rumoured restructure and she was concerned about what she should do and how she should go about um, you know, putting herself in the best position. So he just reeled these things off as if they were part of a shopping list. So I kind of said, hang on a minute, you know, can you see how different 
those things are in terms of your focus and the impact that you're having both on clients but on the team around you from when we first started the work um, and we both ended up just laughing about it because we you know you couldn't ever imagine him going back to the person that I felt I'd met um, when we'd started so it was a real um, identity shift so this was a, a relationship oriented considerate kind of real role model legal leader um, and he did go on and achieve his partnership as well. But what he had said by that time was that whether or not he achieved it in that firm, if he didn't, it was because it wasn't the right place for him. And he would then be feeling comfortable to go on and look for that opportunity somewhere else. So that was a real joy. Um, and that assignment was one of the inspirations um, for the title of this session, From Performance to Identity and Beyond, because it was a transformational shift in how that um, individual saw themselves and their, their leadership in the, um, in the organisation. So the next slide I'm going to show you um, is a picture metaphor for the coachy experience. Okay. <laughs> So I'm hoping from the giggles that we've got a few other Toy Story fans in the house. So raise your hand if you've seen Toy Story number one. Okay, so most people, fantastic. So you will know then that Buzz Lightyear, so you can see the main Buzz Lightyear and an extra buzz in this photo. But when he first starts out, he does not know that he is a toy. He believes that he can only breathe if he's wearing his space helmet. And there's a scene in the film where it gets flicked back for the first time and he falls to his knees and he thinks he can't breathe. But of course, he comes to terms with that new awareness and it's a paradigm shift for him. And he sees himself differently going forward and he's able to go on and kind of become um, a, a real leader um, among the group and become uh, a hero of the story. And sometimes it can seem that dramatic. So whether the shift in awareness is coming from feedback in diagnostic tools or from conversation and insight within the coaching relationship itself um, can be some really powerful changes. Sometimes it's more gradual. Um, so another example of a, what I thought was going to be a tough assignment um, was working with the engineering director in a rail organisation. So he was at least honest. Um, this was part of a big cultural change programme. And he said, look, he said, I'm, I'm doing this because we're all doing it, but I wouldn't have chosen to do this. I'm, I'm an old dog. I'm not sure what new tricks you're going to teach me. But, you know, here we are. So I was like, OK, well, thank you for sharing that. At the end of that first session, well, no, I'd rather know. I, I know that. You know, I can say, okay, so how do we make it as useful for you as possible? Um, you know, really, he thought his time would be better spent directing some engineering products rather than sitting in a room with me, kind of navel gazing as he saw it. By the end of the first two hours, he said, "Oh, I've, I've said a lot about myself to you this afternoon. It feels like it was actually quite useful." So it was a chink of light. Um, and by the end of four sessions, um, he said that the reflectiveness of coaching had really helped him, that it challenged him to think about who he was at work in ways he hadn't considered before and how he could be a better leader to his people. So his focus as well shifted from very much the kind of the technical and the doing um, to sort of the legacy that he was leaving behind him. This was someone who had maybe about another three or four years to work um, before he could hit that magic age and claim his pension. Something else I've noticed really commonly with leaders is how often um, a lack of confidence can play a part, no matter how senior they are, no matter how expert they are, but a lack of confidence, a form of the submissive position that gets called imposter syndrome, can often show up um, for people. And they can be working incredibly hard because, of course, that defensive pattern drives behaviours like putting in long hours, putting your organisation's needs above your own, trying to go the extra mile, trying to hit an imagined standard here when the real standard's here. So that pattern can drive a lot of very high performance behaviours in individuals. But of course, it's not sustainable. And um, we talked about work-life balance right at the beginning. And it's not nice inside your own head if you're constantly beating yourself up even when you're doing really well. So it might be a function of um, the kind of coaches that have chosen to work with me or that I attract, but it's something that I've noticed as a, a real theme. And again, in terms of thinking about empathy for what can sometimes seem quite powerful or even quite difficult people, I've often noticed um, that that's been at play. In terms of what coaches themselves have said, um, and a theme that comes up a lot has been the value of having time to hear myself think, of being really listened to. Um, and apart from an initial disappointment that it wasn't my incredibly incisive 
questions or helpful tools, it kind of made me think, well, actually, that takes us right back to the beginning again. So to our humanistic tradition, being with someone in contact, in a relationship, listening. And of course, Nancy Klein's book, Time to Think, and the importance of a listening environment is now um, really widely adopted um, in corporate um, life as well. So last few things to share with you. Um, one is around supervision. Um, and this quote made me laugh out loud the first time I read it. Um, because it reflected my life for the last 10 years. So organisational consulting and coaching are extremely demanding activities which involve taking decisions in isolation, struggling with ethical dilemmas or invitations to collude with dysfunctional organisational behaviour. OK, so hands up if you recognise that one. <laughs> so a few people out there. So this is one of the reasons that for you as an individual, um, supervision is really important within your corporate coaching. Um, it can be a tough gig, um, a joyful one, an interesting one, but it can be um, a tough gig. Um, I've found with some of my own experiences that it's been at times, um, at times bearing your soul, at times quite cringeworthy, admitting to things in group process, but also at times incredibly um, reassuring and always insightful. Um, to have supervision, uh, whether one-to-one -one, um, or in a group. Um, so getting past issues of 2020 hindsight, being able to recognise that whatever that comes up is relevant for the coachee is OK, and to work with that. Um, and just the reassurance, by and large, that you're doing OK. So again, remember that 88% of organisations in the Riddler report see supervision as an essential requirement for an external coach. So I um, would really encourage you, um, you know, for, the, for all the right reasons to get involved. In my own work as a supervisor, um, and I've loved um, moving into that space, it's fascinating and a real privilege to help other coaches um, with the cases that they're working on. Something that I've noticed is it often has quite a serious tone to it. So the metaphors around supervision are sometimes the role of a nurse or a teacher um, or a police officer. Um, but as I'm developing my own practice, I would like to really recast that to be more like, for you as coaches, um, a visit to a high-end health spa. Mm -hmm. So where you will get a workout with a personal trainer who will stretch you, but where you'll also get a relaxing or invigorating massage to easy aches and pains, and where you'll also get um, a super meal cooked for you by a top chef. So I think those are the three things that, that I would like um, supervision um, to really be about. So if most people here, I think, weren't doing much corporate coaching, um, and I guess you're here partly because you would like to do more. Um, so top 10 tips um, for moving into this space. First is to recognise what you have to bring. Um, often it's the grit in the oyster that makes a pearl, and what corporations definitely don't want is coaches who are all clones um, to each other. So leverage whatever it is that's unique to you. Make sure, however, you can get that across in business language. Um, so describe yourself in a, a credible and business-oriented way. Okay. Number three is to keep on developing your business empathy. So lots of things you can easily do. Um, so if you don't already, for example, subscribe to HBR. You can get a bunch of um, Harvard Business Review articles for free um, online, straight in your inbox. Um, another one, if you're an early bird, is the uh, BBC Radio 4 business reports at 6.15 every weekday. Um, if you're not an early bird, listen to it back on iPlayer. Lasts for just 15 minutes. We'll typically include uh, an interview with um, uh, someone from a large business that's in the news. We'll include some stock market commentary um, and we'll give you real kind of good insights into to what's going on in the big business world if it's not where, you, where you're at right now. Number four. Um, approximate, so use what you know. So it might be that you're working in a field, for example, that's becoming more popular in the corporate environment. If I were to go back five or six years, um, the whole area of mindfulness would still be seen as something pretty avant-garde. These days, it's rare that I don't meet a leader um, who hasn't got either headspace on the app or pursuing some kind of mindfulness program, even through their work. So think about what it is that you can do um, that will help you get access into the corporate arena. Um, number five is to um, review your website, um, or if you don't have one, to consider creating one, um, because people will look you up. Also to make sure that what's there is relevant for the corporate audience. Um, so I was recently onboarding a coach for Fourth Path who has a counselling business. Everything in their website was great, 
for a counselling audience, but didn't mention that they were working in the corporate arena. Similarly is number six, um, so sharpen up your LinkedIn profile. So quick show of hands if you are active on LinkedIn, so you've got a profile, you're commenting on things two or three times a week, so not so many. So again, this is where your coaches will look you up. Um, this is the Facebook for business, um, if you're not already using it. So being active and being credible on there with a, a living CV um, is really important. Number seven, not a surprise after what we've discussed, but be in supervision um, for all of the benefits that it can bring. And number eight is to seek associate coach positions. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more governance and structure in place. Organisations will use um, coach matching agencies very often. And so that could be a good way um, to go from being a, an individual, sort of knocking on an enormous door, to, to having a, a point of entry. Number nine um, is client testimonials. Um, again, for a recent project, responding to a big invitation to tender, um, we're pulling together a really large team, and I was quite shocked by how many people didn't have testimonials that they already had permission to use, that were up and running and ready to go, that we could include on their coach profiles. Um, corporate clients really love to see quotes from people that you've worked with in the past saying what it is that you've achieved. And number 10 is to use your network because despite all of the governance structures and processes that are much more common these days, it is still a relationship business after all. So having someone who can help you with an introduction, um, either direct into an organisation um, or into um, an agency or a coach matching service, um, again, use that network um, that you've got. Wow, so that was about an hour and 24 minutes. That does mean there are still six minutes for some questions. Um, so um, over everyone to you, if we can keep you from the bar just a few minutes longer.